Good morning. Good morning. Try it one more time. Good morning. Do this one. Good morning. We got it. We got it. All right. Thanks for changing your clocks to be here this morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship with us. Please know that whoever you are, and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are glad you joined us either in the sanctuary this morning or by live stream. The bulletin with community prayers and hymn notes is available by scanning the QR code at any of the entrances on your mobile device, or the code can be found in the pew card. <clears throat> the nursery and respite room can be found by exiting the front stairs and following the signs. Script cards can be purchased in the back of the sanctuary following worship today. Stop by the table to purchase cards or to learn more about the app. Following our Imagine Lenten theme, please join us in the chapel after worship today as we welcome Jen Rubin. Jen is a well-known storyteller from Madison. She is the executive producer at Love Wisconsin, a statewide digital storytelling program of Wisconsin Humanities, and she co-produces the Moth Story Slam in Madison. Jen will help us learn more about how to use storytelling effectively. Don't forget to register your potluck item for the covid anniversary event this Friday starting at 6 o'clock. And it can be, you can register over here on the tablet. Uh, you only need to register your potluck item. You don't have to register to come. It will be a great time of fellowship, memories, laughter, and honoring the losses as well. The outreach board, with your help, will be providing a meal for the students at the crossing on March 20th. The Crossing is our student on-campus companion ministry. Please sign up to donate food or volunteer to help for that. The sign-up is also available on the tablet over here in the front of the sanctuary. Please watch the screen after worship or read our weekly newsletter, The Tower, to see all of the opportunities to engage in community at First Kong. Let us now enter our time of worship together. Thank you. 
please stand in body or spirit as we join our voices in the call to worship. We come together entering a new season to tell stories. We stand together holding our own memories. What will we hear in the old stories? Will we listen carefully? Will we see ourselves somewhere in the story? Will we be reminded of the fully human presence of Jesus? Will we feel many of the same emotions Jesus experienced? We will listen carefully to the stories. We will imagine with each story how we draw strength from Jesus sharing the stories. David Haas wrote words of peace based on a Navajo prayer. Peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us. Let all around us be peace. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ under our feet, Christ within us, Christ over us. Let all around us be Christ. In this Navajo prayer, Christ and peace are one. Especially when we are struggling, it can be helpful to remember that this peace of God is always one with us. Let us now share that peace with our neighbors as we join our voices in these words. May the peace of God be with us all. As a sign of peace, please greet your neighbors with a wave. Please join me in the unison prayer. Gracious eternal God, you must like diversity because you have made us all so different. Different colors, red and yellow, black and white. 
different abilities and disabilities, different strengths and different weaknesses. All are precious in your sight. Different genders, different gender preferences, some com comfortable in their born genders, different cultures, all are precious in your sight. We pray that humankind will learn to love all and see only a child of your making in meeting another rather than someone who is different and therefore unacceptable. How long, how long, O oh God, will humankind build walls of hatred toward human beings? How long, O oh God, until unbridled rage no longer breaks out to wound or kill another? Lead us to aim for that day when all rejoice in the unity of all people. Lead us to dream and work for a time when everyone feels they are welcome in this world and at your table. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. We now invite the children to come forward, come on up and have a seat on the steps. And while the kids are coming up, just a reminder to the youth, we have youth Bible study right after time with children in the youth room. And for everybody, next Sunday, right after worship, we have our family service project. We're assembling hygiene kits for church world service. So everybody's invited to that, all kinds of families. So you're all welcome. All right. What a great crowd we have today. All right, so I have a question for you. How many of you have ever seen an elephant? Okay. I mean, I'm mean like a, a real, real elephant, not a picture of one, an elephant, okay? So if you had to describe an elephant, how might you describe an elephant? Anybody over here? How might you? Gray, okay, that's a great answer. Gray, James? Wrinkly, Wrinkly right? Okay, over there, Marta? Mammal. A mammal, very good. Okay, so I have a picture of a of an elephant there. Everybody see the elephant? Okay. Now, I want to share with you a story. Now, this is an old, old story. So, picture it. Picture it with me. I've got to ask you to pretend with me. Let's say there were five people who could not see. Okay? They were blind. And they had never even heard of an elephant before. All right? They had never heard of it. They've never... Well, they obviously couldn't see, but they've never been around an elephant before. And somebody introduced them to an elephant, okay? The first person walked up to the legs, and he grabbed a hold of the legs. And he said, an elephant is, okay, picture yourself. You can't see. If you grab the hold of an elephant leg, what might you think an elephant look like? Sammy? Tree. Like a tree. So the first person said, no, an elephant is like a, it's like a big tree. It has, it's, a, it's a big tree. It feels like bark. It's wrinkly. And it, oh, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a, like a tree, okay? Then the next person came up, and he touched the tusks. He touched the tusk and the very tip of the tusk. How might you describe, if you couldn't see, and you've never met an elephant before, and you touched the tusk, just the tusk of the elephant, how might you describe that? Go ahead, Micah. Um, it's like a sharp, it's like, kind of like a porcupine. It's like sharp quills. Sharp quills, okay, like a big sharp quill, okay. Some people might, oh, it's like a sword, it's, or, or it's a spear or something. That's what an elephant looks like. If you grab the hold of the tail, tail of an elephant, what might you describe it like? Okay, Claire? Like fluffy, okay. They have like stuff on there. That's a good answer. Any other thoughts for the tail, James? A zebra tail. A zebra, well, can't see, we don't know what a zebra tail looks like either, right? Okay. But your good answer, they, have, they do have very similar tails. Maybe you feel like, like a brush or something like that. So all these people were looking at the very same elephant. Did they have the same description? Okay. If you grabbed a hold of an elephant trunk, what might you say it might resemble? Any ideas? Like a tube or a great big hose, and it's moving around. 
okay? So all these people looked at the same elephant and they found a different creature. Why? Because they were only experiencing that part of the elephant. Now, when we can see, we know, oh, this is the big picture, all right? The same thing happened to Jesus when he was around. Some people wanted Jesus for this. I see Jesus as he's a healer. Some people saw, no, 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 Jesus isn't a healer. Jesus is a, is a, is a preacher. No, 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 Jesus is a, is a teacher. And some people said, no, we want Jesus because he's going to be the king. And everybody, they started arguing about who Jesus was, sort of like the elephant, because they only saw a part of Jesus. That's a cool thing what we have, because if we're studying Jesus from, from the past, we can look at Jesus in the big picture and know that Jesus was all of those things. Okay? So, this week, each week, we had our rocks. And if you didn't get a rock, there's rocks up on the third floor. So this week, I want you to look at your rock and say, what are the individual pieces of this rock? So hold your rock and say, oh, there's a dent over here I didn't find before. Okay? Or there's a smooth spot. Oh, there's a bump over here. I want you to look for the individual pieces on your rock and realize all those little bit pieces make up the whole part of your rock. All right? Do that this week. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending us a teacher, a preacher, a healer, a ruler. Help us to see all the parts of Jesus and help us to be like Jesus. Amen. All right. Pre-kindergarten, kindergarten kids, you can go up to room 301. Uh, grades, grades one through six, we're going to meet Heather in the chapel for music time. Let's go to Sunday school. This morning's Gospel reading comes from the Newer Testament. It comes from the book of Mark, the third chapter, verses 20 through 35. And I'll be reading the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard this, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his head, excuse me, mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against its himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. 
Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brother are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. May the words that come from all of our mouths and the meditation that lives deep in all of our hearts always lead with love as shown to us by our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Today we continue our Lenten series, Imagine. We are listening to stories from our sacred text, either told by Jesus or told about an experience with Jesus. We are inviting everyone to imagine themselves in the stories. How do we enter the story, and how do we understand the story through one lens? When planning the series, the staff identified key words we think reflected Jesus' ministry. These words do not fully encompass his ministry, but give, give us a good sense of what he experienced and what he hoped would be foundational in providing good news through the words of the Gospels. The first week, our word was empathy. The second was justice. The third week was trust. And today we focus on the word struggle. Let me first be clear. I did not choose this text in order for us to struggle with understanding the text. However, it could seem that way on first reading. The first few verses have Jesus returning to a house where he has been staying. The crowds begin to gather and People who are following with interest soon surround him. The crowd surrounding him seems to be so intense that he and the disciples are not even able to find time to eat. His family shows up to try to remove him from the situation, saying openly that he is out of his mind. Our imaginations can picture this setup We've witnessed situations where well-known individuals or celebrities are surrounded by mobs of people just waiting to get close to them. But then something strange happens. The storyline shifts. The religious leaders approach him and they call him Beelzebel or Satan. They say the only way he would have the power to cast out demons is to be the leader of the demons. Hearing this accusation, Jesus launches into a response using an illustration, sometimes considered a parable. What you are saying is pure silliness. Why would Satan try to cast out demons of their own family, a kingdom divided against itself will collapse. How would Satan be able to stand if they were to cast out all of their demon family? He continues, the only way Satan is overcome is by someone who is stronger. People. You are failing to believe in the Holy Spirit, which is greater than Satan. The sin of not blaspheming the Holy Spirit 
is the only sin that cannot be forgiving. You have a choice. Make the right choice. That's it. Then we return to his family. And his response to his family isn't one of dismissal, but one of inclusivity. Anyone, anyone who follows God is my mother, brother, and sister. He claims more than his blood relatives as his family. So you may be wondering, where is the struggle in this text? Jesus comes off strong, committed, pointed, and deep into a thriving ministry. Well, let me back up a little bit and put some context around this text. We are only in the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel finds John the Baptist saying, Someone greater is coming, followed by the baptism of Jesus, and is immediately followed by Jesus going into the wilderness where he is tested by Satan. After his time in the wilderness, he begins his ministry of healing, calling out demons, calling the first four disciples. He is questioned about fasting and is challenged for healing on the Sabbath. Just prior to our words today, Jesus names the full 12 disciples. We have a tendency to think that Jesus is riding high in his ministry. But contextually, he is ruffling the feathers of many in power especially by surrounding himself with the disciples who have committed to the same ministry. He is causing so much upheaval. He has caused even his family to worry that he has maybe stepped outside of reality. Back to the story. After spending time with those 12 disciples on the mountain, Jesus comes down the mountain and is quickly surrounded by people who just can't get enough of him. It seems to be so intense, they can't even find time to eat. His family turns against him, and then the religious leaders start calling him Satan. If I wanted to imagine this story through Jesus' lens, I would have struggled to stay focused. More than likely, I would have either hid in the house I came to visit or would have quickly moved on to another city. Good grief, even his family is questioning him. It's hard for me to believe Jesus wasn't struggling just a little bit. To struggle is to try very hard to do achieve, or deal with something that is difficult or causes problems. I'm hearing problems here. David Shanasa Jacobson writes, As a preacher, I usually want to focus on where I encounter gospel in a text. This is especially true in the strange apocalyptic gospel of Mark. In this pericope, I hear gospel most clearly in Jesus' weird parable of the tied-up strong man in the middle of his struggles with family and religious authorities. The parable is gospel not because Jesus is being nice, like you're supposed to be in a family, nor because Jesus is respecting the authorities, like you're supposed to do when you're from Galilee and the officials waltz in from the Jerusalem home office. It is a gospel because it portrays Jesus himself in the struggle for God's coming reign. The word for gospel, good news, 
is not just a New Testament word, but goes back to second Isaiah as well as the Hellenistic culture. Mark commentator Eugene Boring even describes gospel as good news from the battlefield. Now, I do not usually like Bible references that sound militaristic, but I find myself fond again of the phrase, in the struggle. To elaborate on the good news of the gospel. The good news here is that God is not far off and disengaged, but already mixing it up in the struggle. There is a beautiful grace in the notion that God, or in this case, the Markan divine agent Jesus, is not pleased that people are in bondage, subject to illness, mired in something less than life. I take comfort from that. Even when good institutions like family and religious order are arrayed against the thriving of human beings, think of the church's struggle over LGBTQ inclusion, how long it took to get it right, and how long it takes to continue to be reconciled. The good news invites us into the central gospel struggle, which has already begun with Jesus and his persistent ministry of healing, exorcism, and unmistakable forgiveness. Jesus is struggling and in the struggle to make change. In this text, Jesus teaches us how to respond in the struggle when life gets tough. He doesn't throw a temper tantrum, run away, call people names, or even dismiss his family. He actually refocuses everyone and widens his family. He says, focus on the Holy Spirit. You may make mistakes in your life. And if you are focused on God, those mistakes will be forgiven. And who is my family? Anyone who is willing to focus on loving God and by extension, loving neighbor. Those are my family members. The circle has been widened, not divided. When we embrace God, we are a house united, and we widen the circle. And our struggles don't go away, but they become more manageable. We each have our own struggles here. They look different for all of us, but they are struggles. It's just a fact. Just like Jesus had struggles. So it's more how we handle and respond when we are faced with struggles. We can respond with vitriol, hate, and division. And our houses surely will divide and fall. Or we can respond by uniting and widening our family circle. And our family is not defined by blood. Howard Zinn wrote, To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility 
of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. Struggles in many forms inhabit our lives today, whether they come in political circles, in a fight for power, or even within families. Jesus reminds us in his own struggles the way to move forward is to confront the struggles, focus on the presence of God, unite as we are able, and widen the circle of love. May it be so as we move forward. Amen.
may be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, we sometimes struggle to remember that you are not a far-off, disengaged God, but rather you are a loving and interactive parent who is for us and with us in all things. May our eyes and our hearts be opened in new ways to see you. And yet we also live in a world where chaos and struggle are real. May we, stay, may we take strength from seeing how Jesus dealt with struggle when his life got tough. We see that he went to you in prayer. He surrounded himself with loving people. He wasn't afraid to confront adversity, to call out injustice when he saw it, and to seek to offer love over and over again. We know it must break your heart when we hurt each other and when we hurt the earth you have given to us for life. Help us stay grounded in your presence so that we will know with assurance that the gifts of forgiveness and of loving community are with us. Just as we reach out to you, help us to go inside to that place of internal peace where we are rooted in you. May our silent prayer strengthen us for all our struggles. God, widen our circle and create in us a house united. Give us strength for all our struggles. And may we find our courage 
as we join our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I am sometimes reminded to count my blessings, and I always seem to find one more as a result. Speaking generally to the crowd, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, said, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Today, through our special offering to one great hour of sharing, we have the opportunity to share with others, both near and far. Our gifts help families find safety and shelter it's instead of on the streets. Our gifts allow women to sell locally sourced produce and other food items in support of their families. Our gifts allow individuals to create cooperatives so that they may do more together than they could do separately. Our gifts help those recovering from trauma. We cannot be in all of these places ourselves or even see them with our own eyes. But sometimes, through our uh, generous offering, like today, the One Great Hour of Sharing Fund, we can share as we have received. And that sharing may be done through the black boxes at the entrances uh, to the sanctuary, through the First Kong website, or even the United Church of Christ website. Thank you. i 
We now dedicate serve those who need resources to feed those who are hungry and to inspire those who look for hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Nobody has ever said there wouldn't be struggles in our lives. In fact, if we are doing the kind of work Jesus was doing, we are sure to have struggles, just as he did. But when we find ourselves in the middle of our struggles, I hope that we open our ears and listen for the Holy Spirit's uniting voice. A house divided will not be able to stand, but a house united in widening the circle of love will thrive. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs> 